always remember that the purpose of study is at least in part the fact that we do not have all the answers. We are not attempting merely to communicate that which is already clearly known, but to search in the mystery and maze of the world's experience for things that are not too well known, in the hope of bringing clarification. And by clarification, we mean to bring forth out of ourselves additional resources with which to cope with the unknown. What we call growth, as far as knowledge is concerned, is the gradual conquest of mystery, in which by degrees we become sufficiently informed and sufficiently astute in our own contemplated faculties so that we can approach the unknown with organization and help, help to simplify and clarify <coughs> various doubts that may previously exist. So when we begin to study uh, the planetary theology of ancient peoples, we are not in possession of all of the facts that we would like uh, to have available. Two problems are presented by this situation. In the first place, we are not certain that ancient man was in a position to articulately clarify his own position. A great many of his findings were held intuitively by a kind of knowledge which does not base itself upon the strict processes of reason. In the second place, between antiquity and modern man is a waste of time, a tremendous desert of distances. We are no longer able to think as he thought to understand what he understood, or to build our conclusions upon the reasonable courses of events which were sufficient to his needs. Thus, between the uncertainties of origins and the additional confusion caused by the destruction of ancient records, and also by the loss of our true living knowledge of ancient languages, we must present certain reservations on this problem. But with this group of reservations we have also certain evidence by means of which we may reasonably deduce or even induce that certain things were almost certainly true. And perhaps by contemplating the network of symbols we shall begin to appreciate or apperceive uh, the principles behind the patterns which we can now contemplate. We must not assume that antiquity was all-knowing, nor must we assume that antiquity was all-ignorant. We must recognize that there are things we know that they could not have known, but there were also things which they knew internally, uh, which remain unknown to us because we are no longer naturally an internalizing people. They had certain interior illumination, which seems to have led them far in the search of essentials, whereas the outer light of our thinking has carried us vast distances into things not so essential. For instance, we begin our problem this evening with the problem or study of the seven deities, or as Plutarch refers <coughs> uh, to the mystery, the seven rayed God. Why was the seven so vastly significant a number in ancient times? How does it happen that this number coincides with what the ancients called their planets, consisting of five planets we know today and two luminaries? These seven bodies in peculiarly close relationship to the earth and appearing to move around it, have for the longest period that we know been 
highly symbolical and highly significant in relation to theology. These seven wanderers, these seven planets, by the Egyptians, by the Persians, the Hindus, the Chinese, the Greeks, and many other peoples, particularly perhaps even the Babylonians, these seven planets were always identified with seven deities. These seven deities in all these different groups divided and organized themselves in practically the same patterns. And the powers of these deities, regardless of the names by which they were known, were identical. Thus the number seven comes to us with a tremendous and almost awe-inspiring pressure of validity. We know, for example, that there were seven principal deities among the Chinese. But their astronomy seems to have been a little better than ours of the ancient world. <coughs> For they had the five ancestral gods corresponding to the planets. And they also had two other deities corresponding to the sun and moon. You'll remember uh, the time of the Annunciation of the birth of Confucius. Five old men entered in a vision, carrying or leading among them the Kirin or Keeling, a magical animal, a kind of unicorn. And these five announced the coming of the great sage. At the time of this birth, it is said, these five old men were on the roof of the house in which he was born. Now the Chinese emperors for at least 2,500 years have celebrated the mystery of the five old men. And they were definitely and distinctly the planets. These same Chinese people also intimated two mystery gods that were concealed behind other symbols. Perhaps these mystery gods were the two planets that were later to be discovered. Uranus and Neptune concealed beneath the symbolism of the sun and moon which served temporarily to complete the septenary. But we also know that in the Buddhist doctrine there were seven primary Buddhistic powers. These seven are the great eternal bodhisattvas are never represented however in their fullness. We have only five. Like the five old men of China we have the mention of seven Dhyana Buddhas but we only have pictorial presentation of five arranged in the form of a hollow square with the fifth in the center. Now the Greeks had the same subterfuge of using five and two in a very strange combination. Philo Judaeus tells us the seven planetary gods were the vowels <coughs> or the seven powers of sound. Is it not interesting therefore that we are still having trouble with our seven vowels? We only recognize five. And we have a funny old doggerel verse that uh, has been used in school for a long time. The vowels are A, E, I, O, and U, sometimes W and Y. We've never been able to quite arrange this W, Y situation. We have, however, the five vowels that we know. Researchers, even in so conservative, field, conservative a field as Dr. Rhymes, in his extrasensory perception research, follows the old belief that man has seven senses, but we can only find five. Again, two concealed. And we are told that these two concealed sensory perceptions relate to the extrasensory gamut, or perceptions that are as yet in potential, but not yet in potency, in the life of the average human being. Thus we have a series of strange fives that fall short of seven. And this peculiar situation has continued even into the study of sacraments. 
where certain sacraments were for the laity and certain only for the priesthood. Uh, the ancient Kabbalah says that originally Moses wrote seven books, of which five are the Pentateuch and the others are lost. The so-called sixth and seventh book of, Mo of Moses that you can buy in paper bindings in some bookstores, these, uh, this compound is a forgery dating from the Middle Ages. But the five books of the law are said to have been only five-sevenths of the original revelation. So this five again appears. And wherever this five appears, it has been tied to the planetary mystery. Now if we wish to assume that the divine creative power was a septenary, let us consider for a moment what Pythagoras thought of the septenary. From the earliest studies of numerology, back in the classical period when folks really took it seriously, and uh, which at the time when it was applied directly to certain classic alphabets, and this is important because in ancient times men paginated and numeralized by means of letters, which we no longer do. Therefore pages were lettered instead of numbered and every letter had its numerical equivalent, unvaried. We do not have this in English. But according to Pythagoras, the number seven was the number of law. It was the number of the universe. It was the number of the gods and of the immutable principles which lie at the root of existence. Irenaeus tells us that one of the old Gnostic symbols of Christ showed the head of the Savior surrounded by a halo of seven rays, these rays assumedly representing the seven powers, the messianic dispensation. We learn in the book of Revelation of seven churches which are in Asia, and these of course carry very closely to the seven chakras of the tantric Vedantic system in India. And the moment we go into the problem of the seven chakras, we come again into the five-seven difficulty because our systems in Asia break up and some systems insisting that there are only five of these centers and the other systems representing five developed out of seven and two in potential. So we come back to this strange number again and this number constantly fights the struggle between the five planets and the seven members of the solar system anciently known and recognized. On another level then, let us go back to our Egyptian religion, where we learn that Ta, P-T-A-H, the potter of Memphis, the deity who fashioned the world upon a potter's wheel in the form of the egg of Seb, the great mother goose. By the way, a little tie up to our fairy story and our fairy stories and our mother goose legends, because in several religions, the world was, the, was created in the form of the egg of a mother goose. Rather curious. But folklore has stepped in and distorted these things almost beyond resemblance to the facts. But Ta, who fashioned the world egg, similar to the world egg of the Greeks, which broke into the golden and silver hemispheres and gave birth to Castor and Pollux. But this egg, fashioned on the potter's wheel, uh, was the work of the master builder, the master potter, and Ta was the lord, governor, and presiding genius over the seven Armonian artificers. And these Armonian artificers in Egypt were dwarfs, mysterious little beings represented glyphically as gnome-like figures, each of which held in its hand a bare knife, held in this kind of a position, upright knife. These were the knives with which the worlds were gouged out of space. And the uh, seven Armonian artificers are said to have come out of the earth near the site of the Great Pyramid. They were the ancient ones, the formators, the fashioners of things. And there were therefore, among the Egyptians, beliefs about the seven creating powers or laws. In the ancient Kabbalah, the creating fiat or word was spoken in the form of the seven vowels, two of which again 
were mystery vowels or secret letters which could not be known and for the deficiency of which the great name could not be restored, captured, or preserved. In the Jewish early works in Genesis, we find in the opening chapters the Elohim. And the Elohim are the seven creating powers of the great deity who is said to have fashioned the world in the opening chapters of Genesis. These are the spirits of God that moved upon the face of the deep. Their number was identical with that of the Armonian artificers of Egypt. They were the powers or creating attributes released by the speaking of the word of creation. And this word was always a word composed of vowels. So we go back to the mystery of the five dash seven vowels. All these points to all these things point to some kind of a doctrine which frankly and obviously is very difficult to trace after so long a time but it meant something and had a very clear and definite bearing upon the entire structure of the universal organization as it was known to the ancients. Pythagoras in defining this mystery of the seven goes on to relate it to the seven powers of universal generation and in explaining this he tells us and Plato later corroborates him that the, power, that the soul was a numerical mystery patterned in the geometry of seven that the soul of man actually consisted of seven parts and an eighth sphere now this eighth sphere also arises in the ancient religious doctrine the eighth sphere appears in the Gnosis and in the recent discovery of Gnostic books in Egypt, probably the most important religious find in the modern world, far more important than the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, these books incidentally were found earlier, slightly earlier than the Dead Sea Scrolls, but are not as well known. In this Gnostic collection, we have a very great deal of information bearing upon the esoteric use of numbers and of the various deities and principles that are represented by them. Pythagoras, who was perhaps one of the outstanding leaders of the study of number letter relationships, pointed out that man in contemplation, energizing within himself but not speaking the vowels, that this energization moved into various relationships to himself so that in, in thinking or internally sounding these vowels he had the sense of their forming a pattern around him in space some of the vowels have to be thought or sounded above others below some before and others behind some in the center these vowels naturally by their sounds produce patterns that are of the greatest importance. In the Epistle uh, Sophia, in the Book of the Saviors, and the Gospel of Truth, the great Gnostic writings, we also learn of this eighth power, or eighth sphere, from above below. And this eighth sphere is called the abyss, or the dead world, or the world of darkness. And the eighth sphere is our planet thus applying to the ancient uh, a mystery which in the Gnostic ritual is sometimes called the abortion. It is the abode of the fallen spirits and it is also as Pythagoras pointed out the sphere of generation. So he bestowed upon the seven energies of the soul an eighth power which he called the power of generation. The eighth power of the soul being that which precipitates it into body and creates its association with physical and material things. Thus the eighth planet and your Yezids of Iraq, uh, your various sects worshipping the diamond peacock, also know of the mystery of the eighth sphere. And we have intimations of it and hints of it in many places. We find it in uh, Christian religious symbolism 
where the virgin, clothed with the sun and carrying a man-child in her arms, is standing upon a globe. This globe is the eighth sphere which is beneath her feet, just exactly as it is presented in the Gnostic rituals. Now if you go back to Revelation for a moment, you will come to the seven lamps and the great figure that moves among them. And we know that in the tabernacle and temple rites of the old Jews, the seven-branched candlestick is the symbol of the seven planets. All of this shows a tie. It shows this tie returning. I talked to some of the um, medicine priests among our southwestern Indians. To them the planets also have peculiar meaning, although these Indians do not appear to be aware of any astrotheological symbolism such as we know. Still these planets are superior beings, and why a light in the sky should so universally be so regarded, where it has no correspondence in human experience, can only tell us that either there was an ancient diffusion of this knowledge or that man has intuitively developed it within his, within his own psychic nature. And it is possible that Pythagoras being correct, and that, the, that man possessing a soul, which is archetypally sevenfold in principle, that this sevenfold archetype forces man to contemplate everything outside of himself in terms of a septenary. He cannot escape the incessant demand of discovering seven around him because he moves from a point of seven within him. Such might uh, sustain some of our thinking. And so we proceed to some of the theological systems and devices by means of which this particular and peculiar pattern is revealed to us. The seven great gods have always played their <coughs> dominant roles and each of these deities has had a common purpose or reason uh, for the symbolism that has arisen around him. A very good description and discussion of this will be found in Godfrey Higgins' great work, The Anacalypsis, which is probably one of the most exhaustive and, for most readers, exhausting study of the subject that can be discovered. But uh, Higgins, who had a monumental capacity for analogies, trace through practically every religion of the world, not only to discover uh, the septenaries, but also to discover the numerical equivalents of the names of deities, so that these in turn could be fitted into this essential septenary pattern. His attainments in this direction, or in these directions, uh, were outstanding. Do we have, in our experience, certain patterns on which we can build? What are the analogies that we really know, or believe that we know? Let us begin with one of the luminaries that perhaps will offer itself for our early contemplation. The Egyptians declared that Isis represented or symbolized the lunar power. But this was not enough in itself because in all these ancient peoples we can't exhaust their thinking with a single statement. Therefore, we have to go further. Isis representing the lunar energy from Isa, meaning ice, frozen. Something held locked, crystallization. These terms might be applied to what we have often held to be the condition of things on the moon. But Isis, as the lunar mystery, represents the moon in the form of the generative impulse of the moon, the moon as mother, the moon as the source of fecundity, the lunar cycle, which is particularly preserved and was anciently religiously noted as being tied to the menstruation cycle, the cycle of fertility and of generation. Now the moon, we know, has two phases or qualities which are particularly noticeable, namely that it increases and decreases in light. 
and that it is at some times full and at some times totally invisible. Also that it may appear as a crescent or as a partial sphere. So the Egyptians had two deities, the white and the black Hathor, to use in connection with the lunar phases. And the black and white Hathor governed or ruled the underworld. And the underworld, of course, now, for our thinking, is our eighth sphere or the earth. This is the underworld of Plato, to which men come not of, uh, when, uh, go not when they die, but come when they are born. For this is the purgatorial, the underworld, right here among us as we are gradually coming to realize more clearly every day. <laughs> now, Isis has a sister whose symbol is called Nephthys, from which we have our word Naphtha. Now, Isis has always as her symbol the empty throne of the sun god, and Nephthys has as her symbol a bowl a hollow bowl. The hollow bowl, of course, is the symbol of the earth, because the earth is the receptacle of energies, according to the ancients. It is the mysterious cup which catches the wine of the Eucharist, or the wine of life. The earth is the sun grail, which contains within itself the sun grail or the blood of the king. If the earth is the receptacle, just as the physical body of man is the receptacle of the principles which make him a living thing. So Nephthys represents the earth or the lunar energy in its physical potential. So the moon and the earth are sisters. And if you go into the ancient astronomy, you will be able to suspect that this could well be true. And in your Indian, East Indian doctrines, the affinity between the moon and the earth is very close and might be regarded as a relationship such as that between Isis and Nephthys. Now in the other systems, we find other deities representing this. We have, for example, Diana who is the uh, great lunar deity of the Ephesians and Etruscans and other Greeks. Her bow is the lunar crescent. She is the huntress. <coughs> she is hunting for the deer and is often found or represented in ancient art throwing her javelin or firing her arrow into the flank of a stag. The deer, of course, is an earth moon symbol and has always been so represented from the deers on the Yggdrasil tree of Odin to the deer that pulls the uh, sleigh of Santa Claus. The deer has always been a symbol. It has been a symbol of imagination. It has been a symbol of the various processes over which the moon has dominion. The lunar goddess then pay, plays many parts among many peoples. She is the huntress, she is the, generate, the generator or generatrix of the world, she is the great mother, she is the mother of mysteries, she is the symbol of experience, of the lunar ancestry, of the things that came before, of the night into which uh, a man turns at death, and the night of time from which he was born. The night moon symbol is very, very prevalent among ancient peoples. We also have the Indian symbol of Maya, or illusion. And Maya, Mari, Marie, Maya, all of these things are water symbols. The proper name for pure water would be Virgin Mari. Maya is illusion, represented in India usually by the reflection of objects upon the surface of water. Mirage, 
caused by water in the atmosphere. As a water symbol, uh, the moon is the origin of life because ancient peoples knew that life came out of the primordial slime. The slime was in the Greek and, and Chaldean mysteries referred to as elos or mire, the primordial slime from which the monsters of Besaurus history, the Phoenician account of Genesis, these monsters came out of the primal slime. Helos is the root of the word Helium, and Helium was the original name of Troy, the city that was conquered by Ulysses. And the victory of Ulysses over Troy, and the mystery of Helena, or Helen, over whom the Trojan War was fought, Helen is an ancient name for the moon. So we have astronomy playing its part all the way through these stories. And we find almost always your lunar symbol as representing an illusion of some nature which must be overcome. Also, illusion in the sense of primordial ignorance from which wisdom is born. Therefore, reality is the child of illusion. Reality is born of illusion. Man born into the world is born into a state of ignorance from which he must ascend or which he must transcend by his own wisdom, <laughs> skill, and understanding. Therefore, through the illusion of life, through the miseries and misfortunes of ignorance, through wrong action, man is gradually pressed on to the achievement of truth. Therefore, truth is forever born of illusion. And it is also the radiant light born of the mother darkness, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. <coughs> so in other le legends and in other peoples, we also find this story of the moon divinity. We have, for instance, uh, the interesting note that when Michelange made his magnificent heroic figure of Moses. He placed lunar horns upon the forehead of the great uh, lawgiver of Israel. No one knows why this occurred. <coughs> but we do know that the ancient Jehovestic cult, which caused or leads to what is called uh, the root J in the Jewish uh, religious history, was originally a lunar volcano cult, whereas the Eloistic cult, or the branch E of the ancient Jewish descent, was the cult of the artificers of Egypt and the Elohim, or the builders. And these two were originally separate religions, but they were blended together. The horns upon the forehead of Moses remind us also of the horns upon the altars of the tabernacle, the horns upon the crown of Osiris, the horns upon the helmets of the Vikings and the ancient Nordic peoples. These horns are the lunar horns. Just as surely as the ancient Ark of Noah, or the Ark of Noah, is the horizontal or fallen lunar crescent capable of holding water in the ancient beliefs what we call the wet moon. Many, many such parallels. But now let us pass to another group just to see what kind of trouble we can really get into. Let us take the character of Mercury. Now the planet Mercury in astrology, which has come down from the inscriptive tablets of Sargon, and which has never changed greatly its meaning, either in Eastern or Western thinking, Mercury, to the old astrologers, was described as a neutral power. That Mercury served almost completely uh, according to the nature of the planet with which it made its first aspect. That the power of Mercury, like that of the Greek Hermes and the Latin deity Mercury, derived therefrom with some restrictions, was the messenger of the gods. The peculiar symbol of the mercurial message, or the messenger, was the power of the dog. 
the faithful dog star. And the uh, power of Mercury was associated with the faithful transmission of knowledge. And the ancients placed this symbol under the control or direction of Sirius, the dog star. The star of the faithful one. And it still occurs in some of our religious relig uh, rituals and so forth. And in the Koran, one of the animals that was permitted to enter heaven was the faithful dog that went into the cave with the seven sleepers of Ephesus. Now the seven sleepers of Ephesus is another interesting legend relating to the seven and this recurrent number. In this case, the seven sleepers, the seven powers of the soul and the faithful dog, the body, all went to sleep together. In the study of Mercury, we also go into our hermetic analogy and we come upon the sovereign symbol of Mercury, which was the original Egyptian deity Thoth, T-H-O-T-H. -T -H. Thoth is actually the root of our word thought, and has to do with the principle of mind. Thoth was regarded as the author of the great body of sacred writings, more than 40,000 volumes. We are not to assume, of course, that these were the writings of one person, but the writings of one mind distributed among all living beings. Universal mind writes all things. The Thoth, or Toat, of the Egyptians later became the Thoth Hermes of the Osirian cycle, and this in turn the Hermes Trismegistus of the later hermetic teachings which arose in Alexandria about the beginning of the Christian era. Thoth's symbol is a stylus and a writing tablet. He is the symbol of the faithful recorder of things. He is the one that receives the messages of the gods and faithfully preserves them for all time. He is therefore the symbol of the messenger. He arises as Merodach in another group of religions, Babylonian. He is also preserved to us under the form of Nebo, the deity from which the great kings of Assyria and Babylon, such as Nebo Belshazzar, derived their name. They base their names upon this deity Nebo. It is also interesting that when Moses died, he died on Mount Nebo. And Nebo was the Mercury of these people, also represented with the stylus and the writing tablet, and in the Babylonian cuneiform, described as the Lord of the Writing Table. The Lord of the Writing Table. And Moses died upon Nebo. And Moses himself is remembered particularly because of the two tables of the law. These analogies get dim in interpretation, but the roots of them are very important. In India, the planet Mercury is called Buddha. And this is another very interesting situation. Mercury is also associated with the day Wednesday in the Nordic mysteries, associated with Odin or Wotan. And Votan again occurs among the Kichis of Central America as their ancient navigating deity. Mercury or Buddha is represented in one of the Indian Buddhistic paintings as seated in the midst of the planets acting as their messenger or servant. Buddha's power as Mercury therefore ties with the possibility of the philosophy of mind. And we know that Buddha, from the beginning of his ministry to the end, preached the danger of the wrong use of mental energy. Mercury in modern astrology is said to show the relationship between the mental energy of the individual and his ability to express himself through the sensory perceptions. Mercury, therefore, rules the five senses, which Buddha calls the five hindrances. Buddha was locked to the struggle to the death, practically, with the problem of those parts 
of man's constitution which are under the control of Mercury. Thus the religious symbolism and the philosophical symbolism tie together. The seven days of the week, of course, are another interesting example of the septenary. And in the septenary we have another curious point. If you go around the world following the sacred days, you will find that for one of the religions of the world, every one of the days is sacred. This is a good point, because it might remind us of the fact that, that all seven days are equally sacred in the first place, and that it is only our own limited virtue which forces us to <coughs> restrain our uh, good deeds, particularly to one day, because we haven't enough of them to go around. <laughs> it's like, you know, Mother's Day or something. Only Dave can really work up a lot of enthusiasm on the subject. The whole thought is wrong. Now, for instance, uh, in the Muslim faith, Friday is the sacred day. In the Jewish faith, Saturday. And in some of the early Christian faith, Saturday. Now, if we want to go back into the fight, we have to realize that we still have, in the Christian world, a tremendous struggle going on as to whether Saturday or Sunday is the correct day of worship. The other five days, we're sure of them. Here we have five out of seven again. And two, that we can't be quite certain as to what they should represent. But Venus is the uh, ruler of Islam. And the crescent of Islam is not the crescent of the moon, it is the crescent of Venus. And as far back as 2,500 years ago, the observers in the valley of the Euphrates have discovered that Venus is never visible to us as a circle. It is only visible as a small moon, never full, but attaining maybe two-thirds or three-quarters of its fullness, but never complete, and usually visible only as a crescent. So the crescent of Islam is the crescent of Venus, as is indicated by the fifth day of worship, and also by the color green, which is the sacred color of Islam, which is precisely the color which was assigned by the ancients to Venus. So each religion, seemingly, breaks down upon this pattern. Here we have Friday, the religion of Venus. Saturday, uh, the uh, the Friday, the religion of Islam. Saturday, the religion of Israel. Sunday, the religion of Christianity. And if we study carefully and go back through the records, which is quite an imposing task, but it can be done, I have gone through it. We find every one of these days was essentially related to one of the great planetary mysteries. Now you have seen perhaps, or at least have read in the paper, the story of the seven wonders of the world. I'm sure if you saw the picture you are as completely uninformed on them as you were before. <laughs> it's a nice idea, but it did not quite gel. Uh, too much economy in the wrong places. But anyway, we do know there were seven wonders. We do know that these seven wonders, whether anyone recognized it or not, were the seven wonders of the seven planets. Now let's just see how that worked out. We'll consider the wonders of the world. Remember now the key words of the seven planets in astrology. Saturn, the ancient symbol of death. Among the wonders of the world, the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, the great tomb built in memory of the dead. This next one, Jupiter in the planets. The Olympian Zeus, one of the seven wonders of the world. The next one, Mars, fire. The Pharos of Alexandria, the great lighthouse. The fourth one, the sun, Helios, the Colossus of Rhodes, the great figure of the sun god that stood over the gates of the city of the harbor of Rhodes. Venus, the hanging gardens of Semiramis, Queen of Babylon. Mercury, uh, the great pyramid of Giza, sacred to Thoth Hermes, the master of the mysteries. And the moon, the temple of Diana of Ephesus. These were the seven wonders of the world. Diana, a moon goddess. So every one of the seven wonders, built by different peoples at different times, were by some strange circumstance dedicated to a different deity, never overlapping, 
and these seven correspond exactly with the planets. And uh, there can be no question that somewhere underneath that there was an intent or design of some kind. Again, your septenary. And of those great remains, those great monuments of antiquity, only one remains, the great pyramid of Giza. The others have vanished in the waste of time, and we know their places by legend only. We believe that part of the old ruins of the hanging gardens of Babylonia may exist, but we are not certain. So here again we have what were called the pentacles, or the magical devices of the great creative septenary. And it would seem to me that developing of this idea might have been very interesting in connection with this motion picture that I mentioned, because it would show an ancient knowledge of astronomy and would also have revealed the mysterious fact that these various nations and peoples of different beliefs and of no great friendliness among themselves had all united to adore the seven powers of the soul. And each had chosen a different one. And each had chosen the one that was wrote related to his own religion, showing that at that time there were seven of these groups, each worshipping one of the seven planets, powerful enough to undertake and complete the enterprise referred to under the story of the wonder, which one of the seven wonders it may be. So here is another case where these planetary symbols have moved in on us. And we can keep on going, and we can find them in Polynesia, we find them among the Eskimos, we find them everywhere. And out of these symbols, we come by degrees, as in the case of Mercury, to the realization that we are dealing with basic or symbolic principles, that there is a relation between the sensory perceptions of man, the races of man, the continental diffusion of human culture, the species and the types, genera of living things, all of which are capable of septenary division, the different philosophies and schools of ethics, morality, all of these great structures fit together to form one basic concept. Now in your ancient Greek music you had the same problem. You had seven musical modes you had the seven strings upon the Orphic lyre. You had uh, the seven basic forms of Chinese music. And you have the septenary restated in the ragas of India, particularly in playing upon the great instrument, the veena, which is the sacred instrument of the goddess of music, of wisdom, and of harmony, the deity Sarasvati. Always the same number, the Chinese name the strings of their musical instrument after the planets. If therefore this number continues and falls along as we have suggested, we cannot question that the ancients held these points to be valid, that this analogy was real and purposeful to them, returning to the seven styles of architecture, the seven liberal arts and sciences, the seven sacraments, the cardinal virtues and the deadly sins, the seals of revelation, the trumpets that sounded, the lamps upon the altar, and all these mysteries, always identical in principle. Now let us uh, take another one of our groups of symbols and see what we can do with the deity Osiris. Osiris, we are told, rules the underworld. You all know, we've read, written about it and talked about it many times, the, the legend of Isis and Osiris, as it is contained in the account by Plutarch, one of the best and one of the earliest authorities that we have. We know that after his cruel martyrdom, Osiris descended into the underworld to become the lord of the quick and the dead. We know that his throne was set up in a mentet, the subterranean world. And here, 
with the attendance uh, of his sister wife Isis and her sister Nephthys. He became the judge in the great weighing of the soul. Plutarch tells us that Osiris is the subterranean sun, that he is therefore the light that shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. This light which shines in the darkness is the night sun of Apuleius, who saw it blazing beneath his feet when he entered the sanctuary of Prosephone. Paracelsus tells us that there are three suns in the solar system, that every solar system has actually three sun structures or solar structures in it, as represented by the Trinuta of the Hindu, that there is the spiritual sun, which is in the true center, that there is the psychic sun, which is in the northern uh, focal point, of the ellipse, and there is the material sun, which is in the southern focal point, <coughs> and the, mar the mental or psychical and the physical sun, called by the Persians and Hindus, Asura and Asura, the true light and the false light, Amaz and Ariman, the good angel and the fallen angel. These are the two suns which fight for control over the human soul. They must ultimately be reconciled in the true radiance of the spiritual sun, Aramazda. So we have the three sun mystery. And the terrestrial or subterranean sun is the physical sun that we see in the sky. Because it is that phase of the solar mystery which is concerned with manifestation of material life. Thus, this is the infernal sun, or the lower dark sun, that we see and which we regard as supernally brilliant. But this is the sun which feeds only body, but concealed behind it is the psychic sun which feeds souls, and ultimately the spiritual sun which feeds all things. This story is again contained for us in the transfiguration of Jesus. And the statement, of course, is preserved in the Bible, where, he, where it is said, My tabernacle is in the sun. This mystery of the sun and the solar right comes down to us in the Osiris cycle. For Osiris is the light of the underworld. And in man, this light of the underworld corresponds to the solar energy within himself, with his heart, and with the life principle uh, as it is physically disseminated through his constitution. Now in man himself there are seven organs, seven vital organs, which the ancients associated with the seven planets. The heart, which is the center and the archetype of the body, is called in Buddhism the Septapana cavern, or the cave of the seven rooms or parts. For the ancients recognized seven structures consisting of oracles and ventricles and related parts. And of course the oracle in the heart is also the oracle of Delphi. For it was from the heart that the great oracular manifestations were revealed. As the man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The heart is therefore the oracle placed in the center of man's earth which is, of course, the omphalic stone at Delphi. In this uh, mystery also, the Hindus tell us that there are seven parts of the brain. And, and uh, uh, Albertus Magnus gives us also the septenary division, that the seven planets are posited again in the brain as their polar positive extremity. And that also, as the earliest researchers indicated, there are seven sections of the human eye. And that every part of the body is septenary. We know that there are seven important ductless glands forming the endocrine chain, which still represents 
the most mysterious structure of the body. And I was talking to a doctor not more than three months ago, and he said, yes, we still think in terms of the seven ductless glands, although we have a tendency to gloss over it, for the reason that we understand five and know nothing of the other two. We have the same problem again coming up. The pituitary and pineal, while we may not say we know nothing about them, we do know something, but we do not know enough about them. We know a considerable amount now about the pituitary, but the Sabbath gland, the seventh, the gland of the, the arc of the entire, the arch of the entire system, the keystone, is still an almost impenetrable mystery. This seventh, by the way, is in the is the eye, the mysterious uh, internal or all-seeing eye of the mysteries which is again the symbol of Osiris <coughs> as worn upon the throne crown of Neptus uh, pardon me, of Isis so these problems come back in great mystery to us but Osiris as the subterranean sun is body filled with eyes and plumed with the crowns of the north and south or the extremities of existence is part of a great solar cycle mystery and his relationship to Typhon and the destroyer is not difficult for us to restore if we think a little. Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent deity of the Mayas, is another Mercury god or another Hermes and under the heading of Hermes we have practically all the messengers of the gods. Now let's give a little thought to our old friend Jupiter. Jupiter or Zeus. One of our problems today is that we are almost totally ignorant of the most interesting mythology that we come in contact with, and that is the Greek. With the exception of those mystifying and hopelessly inadequate fables so lovingly preserved for us by Bullfinch, we have almost no knowledge of Greek theology. We have some fables and legends of Jupiter riding around in space in his chariot or changing himself into a bull and carrying away Europa. These things are comparatively meaningless as we are now given them. But that they are meaningful must have been true. Otherwise, they could not have held the admiration and respect of a people. <coughs>